Rodge. And what have we just witnessed? I'm not even sure myself. I'm so glad we can process this together. My God, we are going to do it live. It's FA Cup quarterfinal Sunday, as it's known around the world. And we have just watched United and Liverpool play an FA Cup hammer and tongs instant classic. Uh, an instant classic in the way, I guess, Dumb and Dumber became an instant classic. I mean, this was slapstick crap, right? Uh, but United would not die. They live. Old Trafford. A fortress? It's fortress-ish, right? I mean, whatever we saw, it made you feel alive. At, when, when United scored that winner, the camera's cut to a kid. It must have been like eight or nine. A United fan just started sobbing and tears. Just let it out. You've seen in that tiny little life. You've seen so much pain. That kid would never have seen the United of Law that no doubt his parents and grandparents bang on about. But he was seeing glimmers of wonder and hope. Um, and we talk about hope to Liverpool. Did we say quadruple? We meant triple, right? Triple. Um, Chelsea, you have joy. Managed somehow to win a game, lose it again, then win it one more time at the death. Wembley again, Chelsea fans. <sighs> not such a happy place for you recently, but let's not be a downer on a lovely day. You tell me how you're feeling after that one. We'll also talk about the quarterfinals from yesterday. Incredible days continue for Manchester City. And what a day for Hadji Wright, that young Californian who propelled Coventry City to a Wembley trip. Uh, we'll also talk about Spurs. Terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Um, as well as Burnley's brilliant one. Christian Pulisic, by the way, scored again. His fourth goal in four games. If lockdown, Pooley is back. I hope, I pray for now, second place, Milan. Pooley, 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 baby. And the best part of these Do It Lives is getting to spend Sunday with you, GFOPs. As you know, we are big tent people here. So whether you want to talk about Pooley or just come up and do your Pooley, Bully, Bully impression, which will be no doubt better than mine because my Italian's terrible. Just scan that QR code in the top left of your screen. It'll take you to a Zoom with our producer, Jake, King Jake O, will get you set to ask your question. Come be with me. Um, it's audio only. So even if you've taken your shirt off, uh, like Diallo, doesn't matter. Just come on, be with us. We'll get to your questions in one moment on this broadcast. But come on, get in line now. Make sure you get yours stuck in. Give us a like uh, on the YouTube and also get stuck into the chat. Tell me how you're feeling. My God, you must be feeling alive. Um, Jake Hookie says, Russell Wilson and Justin Fields are the next Garnacho and a mad hashtag saviors. Too soon, too soon. I've got to say the Justin Fields thing kind of saddens me. But I want to start by raising a third first, Michelob Ultra of the day, to the NWSL being back in our loving arms. I had the joy myself of attending a kickoff Challenge Cup final on Friday night at Gotham one by San Diego Wave. Lone goal scored by Alex Morgan in the 88th minute. Seconds after, I crap you not, I started to watch the game with the injured Lynn Williams uh, and Rose Lavelle. Genuinely, I walked in to say hello and Alex Morgan scores. I'm not claiming the goal was my fault, but my God, I wanted the earth to swallow me whole. The guilt I felt, I still feel. By the way, nearly 15,000 people at that game. Uh, and then yesterday, true joy to witness the scenes in Kansas City as the current opened their new stadium. First ever in the world to be purpose-built to host professional women's soccer and professional women's soccer only. It was a delirious scene. Patrick Mahomes, a minority investor for the current, opened the place. And Kansas City and the Portland Thorns then put on a show. Nine goals. Uh, the winner delivered by a 16-year-old Alex Pfeiffer, who became NWSL's youngest ever goal scorer um, from St. Louis, netted the winner. Um, she's just 16 years, three months, 19 days old. She was born in 2007. I'll let that sink in to more much more this season to come. But let's FA Cup it in the face, starting with Manchester United, Liverpool. 
quadruple dreams, descending upon Old Trafford that once and former theatre of dreams, Wembley within touching distance, Jurgen Klopp's squad thundered in after obliterating Sparta Prague on Thursday, scored four times in the opening 14 minutes alone. Uh, there was positive news for United fans ahead of this one, Rasmus Hoyland back from a four-match layoff, which snapped his uh, ecstatically hot form, how they'd missed him. But this game um, was Marcus Rashford actually came on our show and said this to us this week on YouTube. You can find the interview. Um, I adore that man. I do think he's a, a soulful, beautiful bloke. And he said, the FA Cup is our season. That was their mindset as they came into this game. It was Ten Hag's everything, really. If Ten Hag was trying to hold on to his job and the new management, um, this had to be this had to be his everything. And United players began optimistically in the opening. First at every second ball, charging at the Liverpool back line with an admirable relish. When Vasaka, Rashford, uh, wrapping warning shots, warnings not taken. Because then the magical Garnaccio was slipped into a blind spot right behind a sleeping Liverpool back line by Rashford. Kwanzaa and Gomez just watching. And Garnaccio, we Everton fans know just how much he clearly hates Scousers. Um, his aim was true. Kelleher repelled. But McTominay, Liverpool not boxing out on the rebound. You've got to get those boards. And Scott was left to slap home his ninth goal of the season. Cue the joy of someone who just proved themselves to themselves. I mean, as a team, not just as an individual. And Liverpool, got to be said, looked bloody fatigued. They looked gobsmacked. They looked for most of that first half as a shadow of the team they were against Manchester City just last week. The press, a step off. And when that's a step off, Everywhere suffers, particularly the right side of the field, a vulnerability. Uh, McTominay had a chance to thrash one to make it 2-0, but parried again by Kelleher. Um, Liverpool, anxiety kicking in because, remember, United have been the only team who stopped Liverpool scoring this season um, earlier uh, in the year. And they were doing an admirable job of repeating that again, defending with a cohesive uh, repellent, or so it seemed. But then, stroke of half-time, Kwanzaa ghosted past Rashford. The ball worked to the excellent McAllister, and he slammed the ball home off a kind deflection from poor Kobe Mainu. It would get worse for Manchester United within three minutes. Darwin Nunez turned Varane, slammed the ball at Onana, who could only oh, knock it to the feet of the single gent who destroys United more than any other. Mo Salah ran the ball home, even with essentially one bloody hamstring. He's too much for United to handle. This is incredible. Salah, 14 games against United, 13 goals. He kind of lives to torment uh, Manchester United once again. It seemed like the storyline was Manchester United faced adversity and fell apart. Um, Salah, God, indeed, he tears United apart again. 9,000 Liverpool fans in attendance. Holy crap. Even when their team plays poorly, and they did for long stretches of that first half, they only seem to experience joy. I watched on as an Everton fan. My God, and I thought, oh, if only I could experience just fragments of that happiness. Second half became in many ways a referendum on Ten Hag's ability to have his team rebound in a massive game after being smacked in the teeth. And it didn't look good at the top. They did initially make a good faith effort to find a way back in. Uh, but left themselves woefully open at the back over and over the space they left in midfield. Cavernous. Uh, the attempt to muster a clenched fist became ragged. Uh, the shattered players went into that mode. We've seen it so much uh, with United, not just under Ten Hag. This was the same under Mourinho, of putting their heads down as individuals so that they didn't become the scapegoat. And it became structureless. Really, United, a footballing mush. Liverpool, though, failed to put the game away. Um, and though Ten Hag, all he could do, how we laughed, bring on who? Maguire and Anthony, uh, which only seemed to exacerbate the darkness that was swamping Old Trafford. But then, out of nothing, Gonacho again did his step over dance into the box. Oh, the ball fell to that much derided Anthony. Back to goal. And he just summoned. It was like watching, you know, those vocal comedians who put it like on Twitter or YouTube, uh, like Conor Moore, if you know who he is. He does all the managerial voices all at once. He'll do like a video where he does five managers. He'll do a Klopp and Mourinho and Ancelotti, and they're all dead on, um, you know, to perfection. Because Anthony, it was like he suddenly chose to seize that moment to do, I guess, an impression 
of a professional footballer. He did an impression of someone who's quite good at the game we love. And with his wrong foot, his right foot, I'm not making this up. This happened. You don't believe me, but it did. Anthony span round and lashed one home with precision and shock. His second big boy goal of the season. First was at Newport. He just lives for the FA Cup, that man. Loved his celebration, just pointing with one finger. You said I wouldn't score one goal. I've scored one goal. Liverpool suddenly hanging on. And with the last kick of the 90 minutes, Marcus Rashford found him in behind. This was like Chekhov's gun, one-on-one. We never found out if it was offside or not, but this was his moment. Goal at his mercy, rolled the ball agonisingly the wrong side of the post. My Lord, my Lord, how I ate for him in that moment. The human theatre. I mean, Liverpool now look gassed, but this game made no sense at all. Teams seem to be undone when they're at their strongest. And thus, 105th minute, Harvey Elliott, possibly, you tell me if this is true or not, possibly the most scouse-looking non-scouser that ever scoused, lashed one from deep, took a wicked deflection at high speed off Ericsson, uh, which is enough to take it away from Onana's despairing hand. Um, and earn half an instant clop hook. It felt like job done. Mason Mount came on, felt sorry for him. What a way to come back after four months to this. Um, United cramping all over the field. Topsy-turvy madness. His team seemed out for the count. It really did, which meant, according to the rules of this game, they were the ones to snap back from the canvas, like the Undertaker, Bruno McTominay, both visibly, by the way, barely able to walk as human beings, somehow giving their dying breaths to set up who? Rashford. And he seized his moment this time, kept his head when all around you doubted him. Finished like the Rashford of our imaginations. But that was just the amused bouche. Uh, because Liverpool, they won a corner late. Harvey Elliott held onto the ball too long on the edge of the area. Pickpocketed. United jailbreak. Gonaccio leading it. Slipped the yellow. Um, in, out, wide. Um, though too wide, it seemed. But bloody hell, he finished as if his whole life had led up to that moment. In a way, it had. Dude then took his shirt off to show his name on the back of the jersey. God bless. Not even his abs. He didn't even show us his abs because he had an undershirt on. But worth the red card for the bants. Um, and was that, that was that. True bedlam. Kind of headless, unfathomable. No rhyme or reason here. Not tactics. Tactics didn't win this. This was just two teams gassed, living in a world of pain. Mental, physical. And for once, Manchester United... Ten Hogs United were left leaping in joy in a season of, of, of profound disappointment. It was United who dug deep, who outwitted, who outlasted, uh, got it done. Jurgen Klopp looked like his face had just been slapped with a wet piece of cod at the final whistle. Quadruple. Oh, you've still got two beautiful trophies to play for, Liverpool fans. Uh, but is this the first tear in the dream that is the last dance? Liverpool must now face up to two weeks of plumbing their own mortality and vulnerability and the fear that they might not have enough gas left in their tanks. They've got to reload, go again. Two more big trophies left to play for. Brighton and Sheffield United next. Huge love to you, United fans. So this game, right? Intoxicating, infuriating and worth celebrating. All the ings. There is life. There is belief. Joy is yours on this day. Um, it can be again at Wembley. Michael Engstrom in the chat says, is this what being an Everton fan feels like? I am crying red Liverpool tears. Um, God bless Michael Engstrom. You will never know the pain. You'll never know. I hope you'll never know what it feels like to wallow in the abyss. This is just life. Michael Engstrom, ups and downs. It's like living in LA. It's just all one season. You get to experience all four through football quite safely. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Jared Sauber in the chat says, didn't think Anthony would score before DCL, but that's the sad world that we live in. I, my God, that why are we all doing in Everton on this day? Can we not just live uh, and save at this moment? By the way, semi-final, draw just in. Uh, Coventry against United, Manchester City against Chelsea. Who is surprised that the hot balls kicked in to full effect uh, to not only give us the chance of a Manchester derby in the final, uh, but also to give United the easier team. Games will be played April the 20th. Um, God bless in every single regard. Bring it on. I love the FA Cup. I do watch it partially 
Um, you know, Diallo, by the way, um, please God will not be uh, uh, suspended by them. <laughs> Just like F it, I'm out of here. I love that. Uh, but also, um, these games make me feel what the US Open Cup could slash should be uh, if it was properly run, properly um, just fated and celebrated. Cannot wait to watch Hadji Rook, uh, Hadji Wright face up to Harry Maguire all over again. Um, this morning, Chelsea 4, Leicester 2, repeat at the 2021 final, which Leicester, need I remind you, won 1 0. Brodgers' finest moment, uh, thanks to Yuri Tielemans. Um, how life has changed since then in so many profound ways for, for all of us. For Chelsea, the cup competition has been some kind of respite in a season of, of self-soiling agony. Leicester now top <laughs> until today uh, when Leeds surged back in the championship. They open confidently, looking to get in behind Chelsea down the flanks, but are undone inside 30 minutes on the break. Nico Jackson in key minutes. His decision-making is actually getting to become ever more calibrated. Uh, he got down to the byline, rolled the ball to Kukurea, who was rewarded for an 80-yard box-to-box sprint. Jackson slapped the ball to him for a tap-in. His first ever goal for Chelsea. Staggering reality. Um, Raheem Sterling, God bless, we have to mention him. He could have killed off the game with a penalty he won, but then decided to limply roll it towards the keeper for the save. Less a penalty attempt, more a come-and-get-me Saudi Pro League play. Poor guy, missed a penalty, blocked a goal-bound shot for Mudrick, his own teammate, uh, then had a blown one-on-one. Really, I think that's the social media haters hat-trick, right, Gordie Howe? Thank God, redeemed himself by creating a goal for Cole Palmer, unlocking the Leicester backline single-handedly with a little scurry. Um, game over, or so it felt, but not so fast. This is the FA Cup, my friend. Leicester had not had a first-half shot on target, so, Chelsea, Charity, Disassi gifted them one, slapping in an own goal from immense distance. I mean, this was, this was just like, this is, in the olden days, this would be probably a goldmine for manufacturers of slapstick football uh, DVD compilations uh, past a flat-footed shock Sanchez, and it would get worse for Chelsea because when Leicester actually did get their first shot on target, it was a stunning human truth from Steffi. Uh, Mavididi, the Arsenal Academy graduate who twisted Gusto's brain uh, before using De Sassi as a shield, thrashing an arcing poem past Sanchez, stunned and rocked a second time. Leicester's ascendancy, just undebatable. Chelsea fan mutiny felt imminent on social media, but then the game was turned on its head with 15 minutes to go. Red card to Callum Doyle for catching Nico in on goal. Denial of a goal-scoring opportunity. Red card. God bless Raz. Uh, who sent that free kick. If you only watch one moment of football, um, make it this one. Um, Raz took a free kick. Leave it to me, lads. I got this and just kicked it higher and wider um, than I've ever seen. And remember, I watch Everton weekly on the regs. Raz hates Chelsea. Genuinely, that can be the only logical, rational conclusion. Um, And with the man advantage, Madawiki came closest with a redirect. Um, I think the goalkeeper and Chowdhury clawed it away. Um, but as tension grew, Raz hooked his replacement, 20-year-old Carney Chuck Jamaica, won it at the death, exchanging delicious flicks and tricks with Cole Palmer to finish with a plum. He's been injured for so much of this season. His joy is our joy. Chelsea were Chelsea to a T. Impressing, not at all, showing so much fallibility, but somehow finding a way. Capped off with a Madawiki Stormer with the last kick of the game to essentially two pay their way to another Wembley trip. Nothing wrong with two pays, am I right? Um, for Poch, I say to salvage a very galling, self-inflicted wound of a season, uh, means something. Not sure exactly how much it means. We'll see at the end of this season. Leicester fans know that their campaign's all about promotion back to the Premier League. Uh, Chelsea fans, you tell me how you feel. To me, this game felt like Chelsea's entire season stuffed inside 90 minutes. And Pochettino, even in victory, uh, was defending himself, pleading with fans to respect his decisions. Uh, That fight, which he's battling, um, still broils on 
in unprecedented chaotic realities. Yesterday's quarterfinals, Manchester City 2, Newcastle 0. A clash which, in the words of GFOP at Benjamin Landry, had all the excitement of two ATMs facing off against each other. A cruel but funny Benjamin City. Sean of Edison out for three weeks after his game injury uh, on Darwin's poor thigh last week. And KDB, but they rolled on. Uh, Newcastle outmatched, um, outmuscled, out everything. Um, you know, this trophy, FA Cup, had become Newcastle's season. Eddie Howe ended trying to play down the pressure he's feeling. Um, and the inevitable pallor of defeat was never really shaken from the kickoff. Um, it really felt like watching a season's candle being snuffed out uh, for Newcastle. 8,000 of their fans, expectant. Uh, came down for the game. Their passion not replicated on the field. Pep, uh, his team scored twice off Bernardo Silva. Deflection creations, a biblical deluge made it all the more miserable for Newcastle, who do have injuries as a mitigation, but will rue a pair of missed chances by Isaac. And the question that will linger, is it a case of Eddie Howe has taken this club as far as he can? Uh, or is it that financial fair play has suddenly been taken seriously at the worst possible time uh, for Newcastle? City didn't have to leave second gear to claim their incredible six straight Wembley FA Cup semi-final. First team in the tournament's history uh, to do that. They do feel they feel inevitable. Earlier game, classic with an American undertone, a Midlands derby, Wolves 2, Coventry 3. Coventry um, utterly fearless. Dominating the game, taking the lead courtesy of Everton reject. So I love Ellis Sims. Uh, but in the game's embers, Wolves, young Algerian, eight Nori, uh, thought he changed the game with nine minutes to go. He leveled it, thunderous volley uh, after a defensive mishap, just bobbled the ball into the air. Five minutes later, he just burnt up the entire Coventry bat line to slip in. Bueno for his first ever senior goal. Um, a Premier League team suddenly sharpening their teeth. Uh, in the 88th moment, but had she right? God bless him. That man had other ideas. Seven minutes into stoppage time, floated a delicious ball across that ended up giving Ellis Sims a late show equaliser. Everton diaspora, better than Everton's present. Then 90 minutes plus 10. This moment, had she right, with finesse and poise and clinicality, arced his body, curved a poem of a strike home. Truly, the 25-year-old from Los Angeles. You'll remember him. He was a person called up late into the US squad, um, but whose rep was, to a large degree, collateral damage in Greg's inability to conjure goals during the last World Cup. Um, watching him... It's been one of the American stories of the season. Tenaciously dust himself off to deliver a season that dreams are made of for Premier League aspiring Coventry. Scored 15 goals, league leading uh, for them, including this poise, clinical, stunning. Again, 90 minutes plus 10. Winner uh, that dreams are made of. Shot their Premier League rivals. Taken the Sky Blues to Wembley. And Hadji... Um, I really do find him inspiring. What a day he must have had yesterday. Scored the biggest goal of his career. And then, with, uh, uh, this is amazing. Who's going to go and see his family for a warm weather vacation? Um, was thinking I was going to have, you know, four or five days just with my family. Um, but then found himself post-game in that delirious situation. Called up by US soccer, Josh Sargent, another a striker on phenomenal form in the championship. Uh, scored yesterday for Norwich, but uh, was injured, could not make the squad. Had she got the call up, and instead of going to meet his family, found himself at Heathrow Airport on the way to the United States of America to play for us. Dude must have been so filled with joy. I imagine he didn't even need a plane to fly back to the United States. Um, his Sky Blues are in the FA Cup semi-finals for the first time since 87. Culver City, California... Um, that they will never forget your name in Coventry. You are now Hadji Wright in Coventry folklore, and it's magnificent. Into the Premier League, Fulham 3, Tottenham 0. Let me read this again. Yes, Tottenham fans, I feel your pain, your disbelief. Fulham 3, Tottenham 0. Ange Postacoglu has spoken so many truths in his first season. Perhaps his most pragmatic came back in November when he declared, there's only two states of being as a manager. You're either under siege or it's coming. And I've got to say, I thought about that because I'm old enough to remember the days of Tottenham Joy. Like, you know, last weekend when Spurs were delirious and completely uh, remarkable in that 4-0 destruction of fourth place rivals Aston Villa today. 
Um, oh, oh, it feels like today. I'm going to tell you, I've watched so much football this weekend and there wasn't even that much to watch uh, yesterday. Uh, they stormed across London to face Fulham, knowing victory would put them in sweet, sweet fourth. Um, locked into the Champions League places. Um, God, instead, they just limply surrendered. Slow to start, cumbersome in possession. Um, before the break, a uh, dangerous ball floated into the Kenny Loggins danger zone by the great Anthony Robinson. Rodrigo Muniz, six goals in his last seven. 22-year-old Brazilian uh, finish with a plum. Can we just say Anthony Robinson? That assist was his six of the season, which equals Clint Dempsey in 2012 for the most ever by a US men's national team player in a Premier League campaign. That is, that is remarkable. That should be honoured. That should be a moment of joy for us collectively. I actually expected Tottenham to come back out in the second half like an avenging angel set to smite. But instead, Fulham, who were excellent, extended their lead. The other side of half time, Lukic thighing the ball home. Uh, then Muniz grabbed his second. I'm so happy for him, by the way. 12 months ago, Muniz was just a Brazilian kid struggling for game time on loan at Middlesbrough, not even able to get into the team. No doubt in a mental hell up there, wondering if he'd left Flamengo for Fulham too early back in 2021. Just 12 months on, and he's now one of the hottest hands in the Premier League. Life can feel dark, dear viewers. Um, and then life can feel amazing if you're strong of head, um, full of heart, and you have belief. Remember that. That's not just a footballing thing. Fulham were brilliant. First win against Spurs in 11 years. European possibilities suddenly rekindled in what has been a bloody erratic season. Um, first team who stopped Ange's Spurs from scoring. This is amazing. Tottenham had scored in all 27 league games under Postacoglu, the longest running start to a manager's top flight tenure in England um, since 1951. That's now done. Uh, Tim Howard in the NBC studio talked about a sense of complacency that he saw. To me, Spurs just looked fatigued, knackered. The back line exposed. Dragusin had a torrid time. Um, Ange left muttering about his summer transfer plans. Um, you know, the, the Van der Venlis defence today cried out for strong reinforcements in the centre. They've now conceded more goals than any other top six team. Uh, this was like an old school Spurs performance for the old school non-plastic Tottenham fans of your to appreciate. United, six points back, 10 games still to play. Better news though today, Spurs. By the way, as an Everton fan, I feel this. I think Spurs fans, you may agree with me, your team not playing is the key to joy as a football fan. I love this. I've loved this weekend. West Ham United drew 1-1 with Aston Villa. Aston Villa crapped the bed. Um, they faced off this morning in a game hailed across England as El Claritico, which I love. Uh, West Ham bounced in after their largest ever European victory. Midweek, they smashed Freiburg on Thursday 5-0. Um, suddenly unbeaten in their last three Premier League games. Uh, they opened... Um, the lead West Ham magical cross from Soufal headed home by Mikel Antonio his first since August hopefully getting the goals out of his system before they play his Jamaica play the US men's national team on Thursday that's how it works in football right um, the game bit of an eyesore Zanillo equalised in the second half both teams honestly played like they had a European hangover um, for Spurs and Aston Villa I mean the reality is England now have a massive upper hand over Germany in the race for that extra fifth place uh, in the Champions League qualification for next season. Yay, coefficients. Um, quick word about the relegation six-pointers this weekend. Congratulations to Burnley, who shot Brentford 2-0 in front of JJ Watt and his entire family. JJ took his mum and dad to their first ever Burnley game, his son. Those three generations got to watch just the second home win, all campaign, 17 big boy points now on the season for Burnley. Uh, Brentford in free fall, two wins in 17 games. Um, by the way, which only made the weekend more incredible for Everton fans. I swear, let's try this not playing thing more often. And then Luton drew with Nottingham Forest 1-1. In another relegation tinge battle, it was a bit like watching a fist fight between two drunk dudes in a dive bar. We've all done it. Um, one relegation place lingers, really. Both of you can't have it, lads. Uh, this was 18th against 17th. Luton suddenly loses a five of the last six. Forrest had lost three in a row. Um, they traded goals. Real comeback, 89th minute for Luton. Uh, Luke Berry prodding home. Um, and the agony for Americans goes on. Gio Reyna, so far down the depth chart. Um, 
Forrest brought on pretty well everybody in that second half, but not Gio. Uh, Forrest um, expected to have worse things to come this week. A points deduction said to be incoming as early as Monday. I'm going to take your questions, uh, but I do have to mention, even though Everton weren't in action, which is why I'm so buzzing, uh, they did make news in perhaps the most Everton-y way of possible. Uh, they're actually in warm weather training in Portugal. Somehow news got out. I don't know how the hell this kind of thing gets out. James Tarkovsky had to pull manager Sean Dyche aside during a meal in Portugal after the ginger hard bastard, quote, jokingly, jokingly slapped Nathan Patterson, that's his right back, on the head. This is the Daily Mail writing, quote, harder than he had meant to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's so mad that the Daily Mail like, got the whole inside scoop, but then also put in to, so they didn't piss off Sean Dyche, that it, it was hard, yeah, but it was harder than he meant to hit Patterson. Patterson was said to be, quote, embarrassed, the players unimpressed. Deitch had to apologise afterwards. I'm imagining that was when his hangover um, broke. Most Everton story of all time. We're even crap uh, at bonding trips. Worst things to come, no doubt, this week as the Premier League is meant to decide on this 777 ownership crap. Um, every report you Google about 777 makes it clear that they are a Ponzi scheme uh, equivalent. Um, my Lord, uh, it's taken the Premier League so long. It feels like they're in a, for Everton, a damned if you do, damned if you don't reality, which is honestly terrifying. Um, to your questions, a reminder of how this works here on YT Live. Just scan that QR code or, or click the comment in the chat, which will take you into a Zoom room with our producer, Jake, who's got his shirt on so you can have a good time. You can come right up to the stage. Do not be afraid. Uh, smash that like button. Let's start with Josh from Philadelphia. Josh, where about in Philadelphia, baby? Hey, Raj. I'm in a suburb called Lansdale. Oh, I do not know it, but I'm excited for you. You're a gorgeous human being. What's your question, baby? So regarding the United-Liverpool match, who do you think feels this result more? Is it worse for Liverpool because it removes some of Klopp's plot armor, or is it better for United where they have a chance to win something after being somewhat irrelevant in the conversation of the best teams? Oh, God, I mean, it's, it's such a patronizing thing for me as an Everton fan to be like, oh my God, uh, I'm happy for United that they can have nice things. Um, but that's kind of where we are. That's the territory we've got into. This is, um, you know, this is really like akin to, let an FA Cup, this is akin to more a ceramic cup with world's best boss, which Ten Hag can now place um, on uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe's desk and hope that's enough really to to save his job. It's in a very, I mean, United are in a very odd place. This is, I mean, Liverpool fans, I'm not a Liverpool fan. I don't know if you know that about me. I don't know how devastated you are. Like this is, the, the, the quadruple did this team in uh, two seasons ago. They were chasing it uh, and it turned into an Ahab situation where they went fishing for major, major trophies. The Premier League, the Champions League and ended up just with the Carabao and the FA Cup and it felt bad. It felt like darkness. This season almost clearing that schedule. There's no way this team can play that style of football. It's just it's like almost like a fool's errand. It's running on fumes. It's the adrenaline. It's the style of football. It's the belief, the commitment, the joy of that locker room and that extra intangible of Klopp's last dance. I mean, it could not hold. I do believe when the smoke clears, if you or put another way, if you were Liverpool uh, fan and you got to choose which trophy say you can't win them all which one would you want a jettison it probably would be the FA Cup um, but so there will be a pain because the quadruple is just a biblical story it's a Greek epic it's one that would be sung for generations um, I mean this was honestly in a way though for United it wasn't the boon it didn't feel like United are back it didn't feel like this epic rivalry the perch has been reset the United are clearly on the same level as Liverpool Football Club now the honest truth was the gap footballingly is still huge the tactics of United all the way through uh, just seem either rudderless the gaps in midfield uh, that Liverpool charge to on repeat um, 
it this was this was a this was a freak and a freak that went United way. So honestly, uh, wire fans, this was like witnessing Kennard clip Omar. Then it was Kennard that clipped Omar in that corner store. You sort of knew it had to happen at some point for Omar. He was just mythical. He was remarkable. He was a lone gunman. He had nobody protecting him apart from his own myth. Um, and when it happened, we all felt blindsided. Um, there is something now um, about his leaving um, that's becoming more real. And I think that's it, ultimately. That's the legacy of this game. Klopp is leaving us. Savour every single second. Take nothing for granted. Uh, this kind of victorious coronation will have speed bumps. Today, we witness one of them. Uh, and how Liverpool rebound uh, from this moment is going to be is going to be truly the story. Next one up. Oh, Christina Stotts, always one of our favourite GFOPs. Christina, remind you, remind us, remind you, remind yourself, Christina, where you're from and what's your question. Good afternoon, Raj and listeners. This is Christina from Joplin, Missouri. Oh. And I am like some of the Liverpool listeners that I am disappointed. However, as I mentioned earlier, I am still hopeful that we can still win two, maybe three, you know, trophies this season. So all is not lost. Yes, I'm mindful that, you know, a couple of seasons ago, we were going for the quadruple and sputtered out. However, I think this time is going to be different. My question is, do you think this time is going to be different? Or do you think history is going to repeat itself? I mean, ultimately, Christina Stotts, the, the, the style of football that Klopp demands from this squad. Um, and what Pep does, um, he keeps powder dry. And then he wants his team to peak the other side of New York um, and gel <laughs> as a machine. There's a reason that Manchester City, with their style of football, where they are just essentially compressing, uh, battering, smothering the team, uh, their opponent, their prey, essentially. They, they are. They're like, uh, they're like hunters who trap their prey in a corner. They, they try and supp uh, suppress the field uh, and play it in the final two-thirds um, and then move the ball at such um, fast pace that nobody can keep up. All you can do is buckle in their white-hot heat. I mean, Liverpool play, Liverpool play, first of all, how they play uh, that buccaneering style, that full throttle football. Andy Robertson came on our show um, and it's on YouTube and he, you know, he talked about how Liverpool do um, win games so often in 90 minutes plus. Um, and he just said it's a mental reality that we can run harder, that we can make that one more recovery run, that we can um, suffer more than you. And that kind of football does you in down the stretch. I mean, it does you in, not, by the way, not just in game time. The number of, <laughs> of injuries Liverpool have had in training. Uh, Alisson out with a hamstring injury from training. <laughs> I mean, it's the tra they, they train hard. They play harder. Um, and that, that if I were a Liverpool fan, ultimately, um, this I, I Let me put another one. I'm an Everton fan, so I find it hard to make that case. Um, <laughs> it, the tiny bit of human in me that adores Jurgen Klopp and feels like the world's a better place for him and wants this story to end yeah. end happily. That's what I, that's how I fear. Ultimately, the Liverpool story can only change with alchemy um, or just yeah. surging adrenaline. And it's very hard over a 10-game period plus the Euro, uh, European games um, to to bet on adrenaline. How do you feel, Christina? I feel hopeful because we are going to get some of our players back that have been out. I know Allison is supposed to come back next month. Trent Alexander is also expected to come back. So as a Liverpool fan, I would rather be healthy going down the stretch with a chance to win the Premier League. You know what's amazing just listening to you? Can we just say, <laughs> I don't know how you take this. I hope you take this the right way, uh, Christina Sots. Can we just say how crazy it is 
uh, that in a way were having to console Liverpool fans about the possibility of only winning two or three trophies, which is an amazing reality. <laughs> Possibly the greatest tribute uh, in its own right to this season, right? Yes, but at the same time, we have to be mindful of football fans. We're not in that, you know, locker room day in and day out. We're not on the training ground with them. So I'm coming from a human being standpoint that, I mean, my goodness, these players know that he is leaving. They know there is change going on. And I'm, you know, mindful of the fact that these are human beings that are trying to not only address what's going on the pitch, but they have to address what's going off the pitch with their own families and training. And I I just, I have empathy like Jurgen Klopp does for his players because I can't even imagine what he is feeling right now. Um, You know what? He's got two weeks to get over it. I'm sure he just, the Christina Stotts hug is essentially what you're saying, which is up there with the Klopp hug in the Liverpool Pantheon. A couple of quick comments before we go. Uh, Gustavo Cacayo in the chat with a great question. What do you think is the real impact of the international break? Will it hurt Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester City in any significant ways at all? Uh, almost impossible to predict. Gustavo, that is an incredible question. And we almost, it's, it's like um, you know the final season of Game of Thrones, which was split into two or any of those HBO dramas where we have to wait three or four months for the, for the end of the final season. Uh, we do not know until it caps in. But essentially, most of these theories are welded on retrospectively. I mean, Manchester City, the amazing thing is, um, I am pretty sure, bar injuries, almost every single one of their players is reporting to international duty. Uh, which is remarkable in its own right. They they don't have you know the warm weather training. They are not giving their players downtime. Uh, I mean, their players will be wire to wire, uh, continuing in their groove. Um, and so ultimately, um, Arsenal and City. I do think um, mentally is that what is going on in Pep's mind, what's going on um, in uh, in Arteta's mind, that's what we've got the other side of this break to welcome us back. I mean, it is the Premier League. Uh, huge, huge respect to them for the way they are threading their plot lines. For us to come back to Arsenal uh, and City, who the Liverpool players at Brighton um, that they, and then Sheffield United that they have to play. So ultimately, I would think Arsenal and City, those late nights in the lab um, for uh, Pep Guardiola, who will be attempting to fathom the equivalent of splitting the atom to absolutely destroy, obliterate, humiliate um, um, Arsenal and Mikel Arteta, but also trying to work with his other hand on on the kind of knitwear um, that he's going to be unleashing on the world that will be its own statement. I mean, it is fascinating. If you watch uh, Pep Guardiola, I wrote a book about summer camp once. And there was a, one of my favorite stories was a group of kids in Maine who had an unbeaten season in the, in the local camp basketball um, uh, season. And they, they, they took to rolling onto the court in their pajamas. Like, it was sort of days when Nike, the Air Jordans were just like blowing up and everybody was turning up for their games in like the sickest outfits. And they kind of rolled onto the field in their pajamas. They wanted to make the statement, yeah, we care about you this much. We didn't even dress up for you. We kind of just rolled out of bed and we're going to defang you. Pep often does that. In the biggest of games, he often dresses down, which is quite fascinating tactically. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, not a big occasion, just playing Arsenal, just looking to uh, to repeat the uh, the treble. No biggie, nothing to see here. So that's what he'll be doing. And I think probably the hardest that will be uh, is on those two guys. Arsenal play City, Luton, um, and then Brighton. Uh, for Jurgen Klopp, he's got a kind return. Brighton, Sheffield, United... Um, and then Manchester United again. My God, talk about narrative. Talk about narrative. That game, that game um, now lingers. Uh, we, are, we are living in an age of a gift that is this Premier League. Uh, Manchester City play Arsenal. Oh, erratic Aston Villa um, and Crystal Palace. Um, great question from Jake Hookie in the chat. Cole Palmer deserves to be starting for England. Uh, all I can tell you is everybody I speak to in England is feeling like they are absolute um, heads and tails favourites. 
uh, for these Euros. Just the way you know these clubs are planning, the Premier League clubs are planning their tours. They expect to have none of their English players with them on these American tours because they expect them to go that deep in the Euros. I mean, God, if you're Anthony Gordon, how do you think about the Euros? If you're Cole Palmer, how do you think about the Euros? We're living in an age of um, of truly talented, truly confident, just Phil Foden clones. Um, and it is truly remarkable. If you've watched England for decades, to be able to even frame this conversation, these players of this talent um, is remarkable. Quick question uh, on our Instagram from at Redbird325, who asks, Rog, on a weekend like this, when there's so many games, so many streaming services <laughs> involved, um, how the heck do you pay attention to it all? Well, there's two problems there, and it does feel like a lot. Um, I mean, part of the problem is... Uh, the amount of games, and it's been a heavy, heavy weekend. Um, I mean, I watch the Premier League. I watch most of the Championship when I can. I watch Wrexham. I try and watch the American boys in Europe. And now the NWSL has returned into our loving arms. Bethany Bolsa, um, the uh, the great Seattle player, uh, tweeted a great meme of the multiple um, the multiple. Uh, 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 Spiderman's pointing at each other uh, with each one having a different one of NWSLs. How many streaming partners do they have? Is it four or five? Um, and um, it's, it's like sipping from a fire hose. With the NWSL bat, which is just a its own ecosystem of wonder, uh, f- finding which uh, game is on which bloody network uh, in its own right, it's like sipping from a fire hose. Uh, it's been remarkable. Uh, but our days are utterly um, overflowing. There are two oh, types of people in this world. Uh, those... Uh, with 3,807 uh, t- uh, tabs open. And then there's those uh, who like to empty out their email inbox. Um, I'm the tab kind of person, so I can handle multiple crap at the same time and really focus on many, many things, which is probably my only superpower. Um, boom, 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 boom. A uh, final question. Uh, from Anna in Queens, who wrote into meninblazers at gmail.com. We love your emails. Thank you for all of them. Rog, saw you at the Challenge Cup final Friday night. Uh, want to know about your takeaway from the Gotham San Diego wave and the match experience. I've got to say, the match experience was remarkable. Uh, 15,000 people, just the energy, the optimism, the buoyancy, um, the clean, clean jerseys, um, the amount of talent on those fields. Um I'd say two things. Gotham is a super team. Um, It is hard to balance a super team. And what was fascinating was to see um, Emily Sonnet um, and Crystal Dunn come on in as substitutes. Um, You've got... um, you know, you've got the players that won you the bloody title. They were already there. And if you suddenly unleash every element of your super team and give them starts, it's very hard to manage a squad like that. So how they ease in this incredible, undeniable, um, just multi-flexible, delirious uh, set of new talents. Uh, Rose Lavelle and Lynn Williams obviously out for a couple of weeks. Uh, that hinders, but also helps in that regard. Uh, but they are going to be a joy to watch all season. And San Diego Wave... Um, I wrote about this on our Instagram. Watching Naomi Gurma, the centre-back, play live um, is, if you have that opportunity, grab it. The way she reads the game, the way she leads that back line, the way she organises, the way she talks through the whole game. I took my daughter to the game, who's a centre-back. I was like, just watch. Just watch Naomi Gurma. Just enjoy this for 90 minutes. Uh, that kind of captaincy, that kind of leadership, um, all I'll say is, Uh, I feel like I'm watching the future leader of the U.S. women's national team every single time I see her, and it is magnificent. Um, Good food in the stadium? Uh, There's a question that's just come in. Um, You know what? I ate bloody well. It was, I'm not saying it wasn't a four hot dog night. It might have been a four hot dog night. Um, And it was a total, total joy. Hopefully the first of many. I can't wait to go to Kansas City. Can't wait to go to Bay City, I hope. I'd like to go to um, a San Diego game. I met the new owner. Um, I would like to watch the wave in San Diego this season if we can pull it off. But I want to finish with a final toast. I want to raise my Michelob Ultra to the United States players on the men's side who, as we speak, are Avenger assembling from all points, including you, Hadji Wright, to unite and play Jamaica Thursday night in the Nations League semi-final. And then, please, God... 
a final on Sunday. By the way, we underestimate Jamaica at our peril. That is a good footballing team. They have some injuries uh, which will undermine them, but they will be able to play in key moments. And we got so much content for you in this week to come, starting with a Hercules Gomez preview. Um, a Jesse Marsh day after the game analysis um, and more, much more to come. Let's save it every second together. Copa America is just 95 days away. Go, go USA. And talking of those podcasts, quick look at everything else coming up uh, at Men in Blazers Media Network. All of it brought to you by Michelob Ultra, superior light beer, the women's game is back with a brand new episode of its Tuesday show, Good Vibes FC which is actually my favourite thing we do. And it's Thursday show Friendlies with Sam Mewis. This week's guest on the latter is that Welsh fire brand Jess Fishlock, a reminder of all that's dropping on its own podcast feed. So if you're not subscribed, go and do it now. Search for the women's game, subscribe, subscribe, spread this word. Um, Bring on this international break uh, where the headlines can often be difficult to follow. Um, so let me recommend our early kickoff podcast, which goes live five days a week, every weekday, day, morning, 6 a.m. Eastern time. Tells you all you need to know about the footballing day ahead around the world. That's it for today. Uh, I am going to go and hug my kids. Uh, I'll be back Wednesday with the mighty Hercules Gomez. Until then, it's Rog saying save it every second watching football. Let's make great memories together. Encourage.